the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, an enemy has done this. Slaves said to him, then do you want us to go out and gather the weeds? He replied, no, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let, them, let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. Gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of, of offense and all evildoers. And they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and a gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. The Gospel of the Lord. So you ready for a little hellfire and brimstone? This is the second of seven parables that Jesus offers to the crowds in, that are gathered up in Matthew chapter 13. Last week we heard the first, the so-called parable of the sower. This Sunday we focus on this weedy parable, and next week you'll hear the remaining five. So I'll be interested to hear how that turns out for you. I'm not here next week. Someone else will preach on all five parables, I'm sure. This is a, a real tricky parable. And what makes it tricky is its explanation. So first, let's get down into the weeds for a minute, shall we? So we know that as the gospel writers gathered together the story of Jesus in order to tell the story of Jesus as good news, they relied on stories that they heard about Jesus. They relied on things that Jesus had said that had been passed on to them. And then they took those things and presented them to their own congregations, just like any preacher or teacher will do. They interpret the tradition for the congregation. Now, people who study Matthew chapter 13 for a living, scholars, tend to have a real problem with the explanation of the parable. And this is how it goes. This parable is only told in the Gospel of Matthew, unlike many of Jesus' other parables but it's told in one other place. You know where? 
the Gospel of Thomas, which is a non-canonical gospel. And in the Gospel of Thomas, all you get is the parable itself. No explanation. So many people, many New Testament scholars believe that the interpretation of the parable may not come from Jesus, or if it does come from Jesus, um, it's to be read tongue-in-cheek. It may be the explanation of the parable is a composition of Matthew himself to help his congregation reflect on the meaning of the parable. Or it may be something else. So I'm going to go there with you. Are you ready? I'm going to talk with you this morning about this text in terms of three things. Patience. I think we are, patience is counsel. I think there's a warning that we hear in this text. And then I'm going to turn from Matthew to Romans chapter 8 to talk with you about hope. Patience, warning, hope. One thing that's pretty clear about this parable we just heard from Jesus is that it is, a, it is a parable designed to unmask our own impatience. Anybody here have problems with patience? Like, when is this sermon going to be over? That kind of patience that, that um, you you struggle to find when you're sitting in the doctor's office looking at the clock and it's already 35 minutes after your appointment time. Hmm? Patience. The weeds that are talked about in this parable, the Greek word for them is zidzania, which I love, zidzania. You can say that if you want, zidzania. And the type of weed referred to is, a, is a, a form of darnel, a darnel weed. And here's the, the, the thing that makes the parable work, is that the seeds of darnel and the seeds of wheat look identical. As they start to sprout, as the plants start to <coughs> sprout, sorry, <clears throat> Let's see if anything, wow. <clears throat> Sorry about that. <clears throat> yeah, all right, I think it's still there. <clears throat> I think it's still there. Um, as they start to sprout, they're indistinguishable. The darnel and the wheat growing up together, they look exactly alike. In fact, you don't really begin to see the difference between them until harvest time. When it's close to harvest time, then the, the stalks on the top of the darnel, the, the seeds on the top of the darnel, acquire a different color than the, 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 the seeds on the top of, of wheat stalks. You'll see that on the cover of the bulletin. It's only then <clears throat> that you can begin to distinguish them. Um, and in the meantime, in the meantime, their roots are intertwined. Are you a weed or a wheat? Are you good or bad? Are you a saint or are you a sinner? Are you a real Christian or a pretender? Just like last week's parable of the sower, this theme is hidden within the parable itself, the parable that doesn't <clears throat> resolve with any explanation. If we listen only to the parable itself, Jesus counsels patience because the gathering of people who follow him is what church theologians started to call a corpus per mixtum, or a corpus mixtum, a kind of mixed-up body populated by real people 
some of whom are usually good followers of Jesus, some of whom are usually bad followers of Jesus. Hmm. Each of us is a corpus per mixtum, a mixed up Christian. Each of us is a mixed up Christian, a saint and sinner at the same time. A pretender striving to be authentic. An authentic Jesus believer falling into pretense. Hmm. That's how it is with us. The roots of the weeds are intertwined with those of the wheat also in our lives and also in our community. When I arrived in my first parish, St. Paul Lutheran Church in Danbury, Connecticut, at my very first council meeting, um, the, one of the leaders of the congregation pulled out a list of all the members of the congregation and wanted to, to review with me and the entire council the entire list as to who had made a contribution, a financial contribution of record in the past year and who had communed in the last year. And in that congregation's constitution, in order to be a, a member of the congregation, you needed to have done both. You needed to have made a contribution of record and commune, <clears throat> communed at least once. And what I discovered had been going on in this congregation for many years is this was the meeting where the council would review this record and then notify anyone who had not made those commitments that they were no longer members. That they could become members again, but they were no longer members. That was not unusual among Lutherans at a certain time and in certain places. That was not unusual. It was called culling the rolls, huh? Culling the rolls. And oftentimes when a pastor arrives in a congregation as a new pastor, that's one of the things that someone is going to want to press. We've got people on the books who never come to church, pastor. I think it's time that we send them a letter. I think it's a lot easier just to pull up a weed, don't you? Jesus counsels patience because Jesus understands that in our efforts to do what we think is good, we often mess things up terribly. In our efforts to do what we believe is the right thing, we often unleash great evil among communities of people in ourselves. The parable on its own, with no explanation, counsels patience. <clears throat> then the interpretation. The interpretation of the parable is an allegory. It takes everything mentioned in the parable and says it must be something else in order that each thing in the parable stands for something else in reality, right? And one of the reasons why many New Testament scholars think that the explanation of the parable did not come from Jesus is because they say Jesus did not do that. Jesus did not allegorize. There's a guy named Robert Farrer Capon who wrote a wonderful set of books on the parables of Jesus. And on this parable and its interpretation, he says this. I'm going to quote at length. Jesus did not need Bible scholars to tell him he shouldn't allegorize parables. He knew instinctively not to do it. And when he did actually indulge in it, he did so with such a heavy hand that the results were almost as good as the famous spoofing allegorization some pastor made up for the parable of the Good Samaritan. 
The man who fell among thieves is the human race. The Samaritan is Christ. The oil and wine are the two testaments. The inn is the holy Catholic church. The innkeeper is the pope. And the two pence are the two major sacraments, baptism and communion. And when a member of the congregation told the pastor that he had omitted the beast on which the Samaritan transported the wounded man, the pastor replied, Oh, right, the ass. That's the fellow who made up this interpretation of the parable. I think if we read this explanation as an explanation that Jesus that offered, I think he does so to spoof. He does so tongue-in-cheek to ratchet up the point that he wants to make at the end of his explanation. See, parables, parables are inherently opaque. And when someone pushes to try to make them clear as day, usually you don't get what's going on in the parable. And so I think Jesus offers the explanation in order to get to the punchline. Anyone who has ears, let that person hear. Anyone who has ears, let that person hear. And I think that what Jesus says in this is don't think that grace means that God's love for you will not purge what is evil from you. Don't think that God's love for you is so vanilla that God will not, as a part of purging love, strip you of all that is opposed to the shalom of God's creation in God's own good time. Which leads me to hope. <clears throat> Which leads me to hope. We've been reading from Romans all summer long. Paul's great testament, his, his great explication of the gospel. He writes to the congregation in Rome, a church he has not visited, and, and kind of as his bona fides, as his introduction, he writes this amazing letter. And it seems that they are struggling with various things. So what he does is he develops for them the notion that in God's good time, in God's good time, Jews and Gentiles, Jews who have rejected Christ and all those who have embraced Christ will be gathered up into one. I'm getting ahead of the story, though, because what he does in the first seven chapters of the letter is he plays with themes developed around shared human brokenness, there is no distinction, and of a shared human hope based upon the faithfulness of Christ, based upon the faithfulness of Christ. And now in chapter 8, which may be the most wonderful chapter in the whole epistle, he gathers up these themes and announces that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for nothing can separate us from the love of God. And there's a small, mighty detail about Romans chapter 8. There's not a single imperative in the whole chapter. There's not a single statement of do this, don't do that. And Paul will engage in that kind of writing. But here in Romans chapter 8, no imperatives. This summation of hope which Paul offers in chapter 8 is beyond our ability to do anything about. So before launching into the impassioned heart of his letter in chapters 9 through 11, Paul pauses 
and describes what he sees through the eyes of faith. And this is what I want to talk to you about. What he sees is a congregation at worship. What he sees is a congregation at worship. When we cry, Abba, Father, despite tensions in the church that he's writing to, despite the fears and uncertainties that beset any congregation in transition, the congregation gathers for worship, calling upon God in terms that bespeak real intimacy. Paul observes this and interprets it. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is God's own spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God that we are children of God. Not because there's no weediness in our lives, or not because we have sought out and pulled the weediness out of other people's lives. No. When we worship, the Spirit is testifying. When we worship and praise is put into our mouths, Paul says this is evidence of the Spirit's work. The yearning that erupts in praise and prayer is the Holy Spirit testifying that all of us are sons and daughters of God. <clears throat> you have hard work ahead of you. It's going to be fun work, Holy Trinity, but you have hard work ahead of you. You receive and welcome a new pastor in the fall, and step into a new chapter of your life which remains opaque, like the parables of Jesus. You have hard work ahead of you to live into the vision that God has for you. But I just want to remind you that worship is not auxiliary to that hard work. Worship is not auxiliary to that hard work. Indeed, worship is the very center at the very center of the work ahead of you. When Scott made sure that we heard that trimming outside is a part of what's really great about church, he was spot on. Because living together isn't necessarily very pious, or maybe trimming the hedges and trimming the, the lawn is a very pious act. I'm not sure which way that goes. But in all of the things that we undertake together, it's important, it's super important for us to remember that this is the gathering in which the Spirit bears witness, testifies to us. Remember, you're a child of God. Remember, together, you are children of God. And living into the Spirit's testimony will give you the strength and compassion and patience you need to walk together. That's the sound of hope. Every time you sing a hymn, you're hearing the sound of hope. So patience, be warned, and live in hope. In Christ's name, amen.